you're going to talk about leadership and experiments in empathy. So I'm super excited to hear some of your thoughts about this. Oh, well, thank you, Zuzi. And I want to thank Zuzi and Saurabh for, for inviting me to share some thoughts here. Uh, it, it feels like it's been a couple of months since you uh, sent me a note, Zuzi, and said, hey, what do you think about um, uh, uh, talking on a topic uh, with the Agile 100 group? And I remember you, uh, me asking, well, what should I talk about? What, what, you know, and, and you said, pick something that you know, you've got passion about, that you're interested in. And I went off and I thought about it. And I think it was just based on a lot of things that were going on at the time. I thought, you know, I'm really interested in empathetic leadership and the importance of empathy. So I went back to Suzuki and said, here's my topic. I have no idea what I'm going to say. So it was like, oh, it's going to be an adventure. So um, it took a little while to put this together. And uh, so let's explore uh, experiments in empathy with respect to leadership. And the, um, the topic came from uh, a quote that I came across from Zoe Deschanel. And she said that she believes that she feels like songwriting is an experiment in empathy. And I thought that makes a lot of sense because as a songwriter, you have to kind of get into feeling what, you know, the, the people in, in the song are, are feeling as you write the lyrics. And to me, it inspired me to consider what if leadership, instead of being um, you're good at empathy or you're not good at em empathy or it's a skill that I'm going to develop, what if we regarded it as something that we experimented with and that we uh, took it a bite at a time and worked to develop it? And if I had to do it over again, I might uh, title the, the, the conversation that we're going to have a, a empathy, a left-brained approach to developing a right-brained superpower. So as Agilists, we speak a lot about the holistic perspective of the whole people coming to work and bringing all of themselves to a team to do the best work of their lives and how we bring holistic perspectives to organizations in the same way. And I think that that's a piece of what's missing right now with respect to how we talk often about empathy. So before I get too far into this, I want to get us all aligned in terms of what am I talking about when I talk about empathy? Brene Brown has a very succinct um, uh, definition of I feel what you feel. Uh, other definitions that are out and about are things about putting yourself in other people's shoes, uh, being able to have someone else's perspective on a particular topic. Or one of my favorites is uh, in the lower right-hand corner, empathy and emotional and thinking muscle. And I think it has both of it. So a lot of times people will talk about empathy as this touchy, feely, squishy, soft-sided thing. And while there are certainly aspects of that, that thinking part of it, I think, is also really important. So why is this important? You're probably hearing a fair bit about emotional intelligence and empathy and the people side of leadership. And the Center for Creative Leadership has this fabulous quote that says that what we consider to be excellence in leadership is shifting. And there needs to be a greater emphasis on building and maintaining relationships. Leaders today need to be more people focused. And Daniel Goleman, who is the um, originator of the concept of, of EQ, of emotional intelligence, he feels that leadership is important because, <coughs> excuse me, of three things, three trends. One is the increasing use of, of teams Thank you very much, agility, right? Um, and he describes teams as cauldron, cauldrons of bubbling emotion. And I just love that idea, you know, and I think about, you know, dropping by, you know, a team stand up or coming to um, a sprint review. And while there's a lot of the technical and a lot of the um, left brain um, conversations that go on and things like um, those, those events, there's another side that is truly those bubbling emotions. 
And now couple that with rapid globalization, the need to retain and engage talent, and the fact that almost all of us have spent more than a year now conducting business via Zoom at a distance from our colleagues, our customers, and our teams makes empathy even more important than it was before. So ultimately, to me, the reason why empathy is important is that change in the concept of leadership. Uh, it used to be uh, what we call the heroic leader, or if, or if you're a follower of Bill Joyner or um, what Pete Barron's and the Agile Leadership Journey has done um, with some of those concepts of expert leadership and achiever leadership, the heroic manager was someone who had the answers. They knew what needed to happen. They could solve the problems, and they basically directed people to do that work. Now, the post-heroic leader, the catalyst leader, the agile leader, the leader with agility, looks at problems as opportunities to develop other people's capacity to handle it. So that, that this type of leader is looking for basically how do I do myself out of today's job so that other people can do it so that I can then help us move into the challenges of tomorrow and the challenges of next year. And ultimately, why is empathetic leadership important? I think it goes back to um, the, the first piece of the Agile Manifesto. If we truly believe that individuals and interactions are more important than processes and tools, then empathy is part of the WD-40 or the lubricant that helps individuals and interactions do what needs to happen in order to create magic in our businesses. Now, I have to tell you though, um, in the world of Agile, there's a little bit of something going on because while all of this has been rainbows and unicorns, there's a lot of folks who basically say, hey, you know what? I'm not good at empathy. Will you settle for sarcasm? How about a little cynicism? And so I think in many cases, in, in, in technical parts of, um, of organizations, but potentially across businesses, there is an acceptance for um, sarcasm, cynicism, creating distance, um, almost dark humor in some ways, rather than um, exploring how can we um, achieve more as a team with empathy. So this is the motivation for why I thought that this might be an interesting topic to explore with the Agile 100 group. And it left me with this question of why, why are we in this kind of a situation where we talk about individuals and interactions but on a day-to-day -day basis, we sometimes swim through a lot of cynicism and sarcasm um, and a lack of empathy. And um, as a good engineer from a bazillion years ago, I thought, you know what? This is where that I concept of experiments come in. I need some hypotheses, I need some theories. So what I would like to share with you are four of Laura's theories of why is empathetic leadership a challenge and experiments that if one of these challenges resonates with you, you might run to see if you might increase your empathetic leadership in your organization. So my first theory is a lot of folks um, approach empathy from the perspective of you either have it or you don't have it. You, and if you don't have it, it's too bad. I have worked with, um, there was a leader that I worked with a couple of years ago who just flat out said, you know, I am not an empathetic person. If you need some of that um, touchy-feely happy sauce, you need to go talk to somebody else because it's not me. Now, this is really interesting because what's being said is empathy is something that you're born with or you're not, or, or not. I'm not very empathetic. Yeah, I can't change these stripes. Does that sound familiar? And this is one of those places where a lot of the things as agilists that we value and we talk about um, uh, all show up in different you know, facets of, of the diamond, if you will, so different, different perspectives. We talk a lot in agility about the importance of a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. 
Now, you've got it or not, you only do what you're good at, you avoid challenges, and you try to not fail because failure defines you. So I'm not going to attempt to use any empathy because I might not be good at it. Those are all characteristics of a fixed mindset. And we're all about teaching people, coaching people, and helping people adapt more agile mindsets, which the foundation, in my opinion, of the agile mindset is the growth mindset, where um, many things are skills that you can learn, and you do what is needed in the moment, even if it's awkward, uh, with a willingness to be vulnerable and let people know that, hey, this is a new thing for me, and I'm trying this out. You see challenges as something to be embraced, and failure is an opportunity to learn. So growth is all about experimenting. And if, um, if you take a look at empathy from a perspective of, I may have more of this or less of this, but what if I try to learn it? Um, it changes the, the conversation and the way of looking at it. Now, in terms of some uh, experiments that you might run, um, some ex uh, experiments to consider are things like being fully present, practicing awareness when you're, um, when you're working with someone, uh, the art of active listening, you're looking at nonverbal communication, uh, practicing taking the pause. So actually allowing a little bit of silence between when one person stops talking in a conversation and the other person starts. And my favorite is leading with curiosity. So from a growth mindset perspective, if you come into a situation with the belief that there's something here for me to learn, and it's okay for me not to have all the answers, then that opens up the possibility for asking questions. Uh, how do you feel about this? What does your heart tell you to do? What can I do to support you? What do you make of this? What, what do you mean? Tell me more. Now, if you look at this list, uh, you may be rolling your eyes and going, well, duh, there's really nothing new on this list. Depending on how many agile presentations you've seen over the years um, and on Zoom for the last 14, 15 months, um, there's been probably this set of um, activities uh, that, that help you build connection and build team and solve problems. And we talk a lot about the art of asking really good questions. It's a foundational element of coaching. So the interesting thing to me here is um, applying these with respect to empathetic leadership should be um, a, a hugely new thing for folks, but it's just picking one of these and giving it a shot. Now, my second theory for why sometimes empathy is a challenge for leaders is there's a chance that I think that empathy and sympathy might be getting confused. Now, Brene Brown talks about empathy is feeling sorry for someone, feeling for someone versus empathy is I feel what you feel. I'm feeling with you. I'm attempting to be, um, take your perspective and, and, and be in your shoes. And the thing is, sympathy fuels disconnection while empathy fuels connection. And the outcomes can be really uh, different. There is a, 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 a humorous uh, uh, series of videos on YouTube from this group of folks who uh, dubbed themselves the Empathy Labs. And they ran a number of, of short experiments on different topics in this space to see you know, what would come out of actually running, um, running some, doing some research. And they did an experiment uh, on looking at how does empathy impact uh, people versus sympathy. Now here's the setup for the experiments that they ran. Um, they were having people come in one by one. So this was um, not a group experiment, but individual experiment run over and over with a number of folks. And as a test subject, you would come in and the first thing they had you do was take a standard happiness test that they had developed. And this was meant to set a baseline and the setup with the folks was this is the baseline for um, 
uh, for understanding, you know, where you are right now in your headspace. And then they had to take a little break and they said, we need to get some things set up before we really get into the experiment we're going to run with you. So just, you know, have a seat here, uh, take a break and we'll let you know when we're ready. Now, during this break, one of the staff members would come into the room and go, oh my gosh, do you drive a Toyota Prius or whatever car it was? And it was the car that the test subject had brought into um, the site and they'd say, well, you've got, you've gotten a, a parking ticket. Oh my God. And so then the head, um, uh, the, the, the testing, the research lead would come in and half of the time in the conversation now with this person that they don't know, they would exhibit sympathy. They go, oh my gosh, you got a parking ticket. That must be uh, frustrating. Hey, you should look at the on the bright side. At least you haven't gotten towed. At least you didn't get a ticket in one town over because the tickets there are even more expensive, blah, 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 blah. Half the time though, they um, interacted with the person who just learned that they got the ticket with empathy. They would share the frustration. They would go, ouch. You know, I've, I've had my, more than my fair share of tickets. It's um, a time sink to deal with it. They're unfair. Um, maybe you can fight it. Um, but they shared in the person's frustration. Now, their hypothesis was that um, this would impact the happiness of the person. And their, um, their hypothesis was that sympathy versus empathy, the empathy would, would maybe um, reduce happiness a little less. But here's what really happened. So for sympathy, when the subject after the park getting the parking ticket took a reworded happiness test, basically to reset the baseline. Um, so uh, they took a reworded uh, happiness test and their happiness went down on average uh, 6.7%. So these people still, did, they were still waiting for the real experiment. They didn't realize that this whole process that they had gone through was the experiment. And now um, what, what had been baselined was happiness goes down about 7% when you find out you've gotten what you might believe would be an unfair parking ticket. And somebody comes in and basically tries to sympathize with you. So then when they looked at the data for empathy, they were quite surprised because people were actually 7% happier after they found out they'd gotten a parking ticket and someone had um, empathized with them about, oh my God, you know, I hate parking tickets. I get them all the time. You know, what a, what a pain, blah, 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 blah. And so that's almost a 14% spread. And so what does this have to do for us as Agilists and our Agile teams? Um, if you are attempting to interact with someone and you believe that you are interacting um, with empathy, but it's actually sympathy, you may be making the problem worse versus at interacting with empathy even in a crappy situation, if you empathize with them and feel with them rather than feel for them, uh, you might actually, you'll do no harm and it might actually get better. And I'll just observe that, you know, happy people tend to be more productive people and tend to um, be less distracted. So from a, a business perspective, I think this happiness test lends itself to what we would expect um, from a, a business perspective. Um, so, so just to summarize, if you were looking here to run an experiment, uh, make sure that you are, when you're experimenting with empathy, to look at um, doing, um, a, using language that means I feel what you're feeling, I feel with you, so that you are fueling that connection. And it's not the off-putting, I feel sorry for you, you're over there and it just must suck to be you right now because that's not very effective. So that's my, third, my, second, um, my second theory. And my third theory, and I think this is an actually a, a fairly big 
um, a piece of it is there are folks who, potentially in your world who understand empathy, um, but they feel like that squishy people stuff takes too long and it gets in the way of the real work. And then it's just easier to um, just the facts, ma'am, let's get this done, cut and dried, and we'll, we'll, we'll leave the feelings at, at, off, off the conversation, off the agenda for today. Um, I would suggest that if for you as a leader, this might be something that resonates. It might be time to re-examine what is the real work and who is doing it, because as Patty McCord, who was the chief people officer at Netflix says, um, a business leader's job is to create great teams that do amazing work on time. And that's truly it. And if you think about um, doing that amazing work, then empathy is actually the real work. And to help your teams do that real work, you might experiment again with investing in relationships, leading with curiosity, asking others for their perspective and listening. Because in the real work, if you are a catalyst leader and you're making space for, for a team to co-create and to collaborate to create the solution to whatever work is at hand, your job is to create and facilitate that space for them to do that work. And that involves asking for perspectives and listening. It involves exploring how people feel about work and responding to others when they express their thoughts, feelings, and concerns in a way that acknowledges them rather than just stepping over it. So again, some, some interesting experiments to run. Now my final um, theory is there is potentially folks who are reluctant to use their empathetic skills because there's a concern about being overwhelmed and burned out. Now, um, this is the other end of the spectrum, if you will. And I have to say, uh, empathy fatigue is real. And it is something that, uh, especially in our, uh, the, the business conditions that we have going on now, something to, to, to be aware of and to think about how to, um, to handle. And there's some experiments that you can run. One is, uh, is to pair in the moment. If you know that you're going to be in a meeting or in an activity where um, there's going to be a lot of emotions and a lot of need for empathy, having two facilitators, so you plus someone else to pair in that moment can really help both you and the outcomes for the event. Uh, another experiment to run is developing a support buddy or network where after the fact you have a way to go and um, share with someone else and to kind of recharge your batteries with, with someone else's support and vice versa. Third one is really looking at um, how do you um, approach self-care for yourself? What recharges your batteries? Now, for some people that's taking a run, for other people that's meditating, for some people it's listening to a particular a genre of music with the headphones on for 15 minutes. Um, whatever it is, uh, especially in the, um, the business situations that we find ourselves now with a lot of distance, a lot of Zoom, that self-care is super, super important. And finally, I'm probably one of the most uh, impactful in the long-term experiments that you can run is look to how you can coach others in your organization to develop and practice empathy skills. So this is sharing the load across the organization rather than you being the person that everybody comes to when they really need that empathetic shoulder to, I was gonna say listen, but the empathetic shoulder to cry on or the ear to listen to. So um, uh, some ideas there from an experimental perspective. So at the end of the day, Brene Brown says empathy is a choice. It is a skill that we can learn. It's not just you're born with it or, you, or, or you're not, 
I'm good at it or I'm not. It's something that you can choose to develop and choose to, to practice and experiment with. Um, and it's a vulnerable one. And to be honest, if you're going to, to embark on a series of these experiments, it might be worthwhile to, you know, level with your team and say, hey, you know, this is something that I think is really important. I'm working on developing this skill. So you're going to see me do some things that might be a little off my usual track. Uh, and this is where it's going. And I'm interested in feedback. So that vulnerability starts to open up. Um, the, the possibility for empathetic interchanges in both directions. Now, I want to leave you with a story um, that really impressed me. So you may know the company Steelcase. You know, they have been around for a little more than 100 years, uh, and they make potentially some of the most boring products in the world. I, I, they're very expensive. Uh, I was looking at um, their uh, office uh, furniture yesterday on the website and, you know, their top of the line uh, ergonomic super duper chair uh, costs quite seriously more than the, the first car that I got when I just got out of high school a gazillion years ago. So these, these things are not inexpensive, but the company itself, even with um, a fairly mundane product, has received a lot of accolades about being admired, best place to work, most responsible company, um, very community minded. And I heard their CEO, Jim Keen, speak on empathetic leadership last year in the midst of the pandemic. And he has this great story about uh, he had been uh, an employee at, at Steelcase had risen up through the ranks and he got promoted to CEO. And the, his first official day as CEO for this, you know, 100 year old company, um, it just turned out to be the day that they were going to be gathering 150 of the top managers and leaders in the company for one of those, you know, quarterly uh, uh, retreats for leadership. And uh, the, the board said, you know, we would really love for you to get up and, um, you know, kick off your first day with a presentation for your vision and your strategy for where, where Steelcase is going to go. Because it's, you know, it's just really awesome timing. And Jim said that he felt like that was not the best way to approach, you know, his first day on the job. And so, uh, he had an alternative uh, plan in mind. And when he showed up, he, 150 leaders in the room, he said, okay, so here's how we're going to start this. Uh, I'm going to pair you up. So we're going to have 75 pairs of senior executives slash leader managers. Um, and each pair is going to go out into the building here. And we have a table assigned for each of you. And you're going to find between two and five employees of steel case at your table. And we've done the homework to make sure that the people who will be at your table don't report up to you. They're out They're in another completely separate part of the company. Um, and here's what I want you to do. So you've got a little bit of time and I want you to have a conversation with these employees. And you can ask three questions, only three questions, that's it. And here's the three questions. I want you to ask them, what's getting better? What's getting worse? And how do you feel about it? No problem solving. And if you, if you absolutely need a fourth question to ask, it's tell me more. And that is it. And so he sent all of these leaders off to have these conversations with employees asking these three questions. And when they came back, he took um, pairs of leaders and, and group them with other pairs and had them talk about it. And then he opened it up and said, okay, let's, let's talk, you know, as, as a group, what's, what's going on. And he said it completely changed the entire conversation for, for the steel case leadership, because they were now connected empathetically with employees who told them what's getting better and what's getting worse because Jim felt like that um, nobody stays static these days. Business 
and aspects of business are either trending up or trending down. And the key is to understand how people feel about it, because that's the key that helps you to figure out how to change things to, to um, write the course, if you will, um, to get back on track. He said it completely changed the conversation. And from there, then that leadership group crafted changes to the vision and the strategy for Steelcase. And that was seven, eight years ago. And Jim just announced that he will be retiring, I think, within the next year. And what he leaves behind is a changed company, not only in the financial and the business results, but also in terms of the empathy and the way that they work and what they have achieved because of that. Um, so I'll leave you with one more quote. All of life is an experiment and the more experiments you make, the better. And I would challenge you to run maybe a few of them with respect to empathy. So thank you. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much for sharing. And it's our last talk. So I would like to invite anyone who wants to turn on their camera, raise your hand. There is this reaction icon on the right side at the bottom. If you raise your hand, you know, we let you speak and um, you, know, you can ask questions yourself. In the meantime, Laura, I would like to ask you about what was uh, your journey being empathetic leaders? So what was the most difficult for you? I think for me, I, uh, I, I tend to oscillate between um, uh, too much empathy and getting overwhelmed and sidetracked by that. And then deciding, well, that it's, it's it, it it's not good for me and it's not good for other people because there is just too much emotion and then I shut it down and so my biggest challenge has been learning how to like moderate it so that there's empathy but I don't go home at the end of the day with all of Zuzi's problems and Soul Rob's problems and you know Jack and Jill's problems because you know that that's a prescription for insomnia. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, that must be tough. So what helped you? What was it a coach you have or was it just the time or what helped you to overcome that? Oh, I, I probably several things. One is, um, and I hate to say this, but the longer you, it, it's, it's that riding around the block more and more times, you know, the, the more experience you get, the more you learn. Uh, the other part was when I became interested in leadership and I thought that I understood the, um, the EQ side, but when you really drill into it, uh, I started to, I could see places where I needed to grow and, and get ideas for it. And then the third thing, like you say, is having a coach. There's nothing like having somebody who can say, well, that didn't go the way you wanted it to go. You know, what are your ideas about why and what would you do differently? So, yeah. All right. So, guys, you can also speak, but you can also write a question to the chat. I didn't want to stop that from happening. I just realized I might. So, um, that's all super fascinating. Now, I assume you worked with those type of, you know, corporations that are not really, you know, that fluffy stuff, not really mm. up to them. So, and sometimes I work with those frustrated scrum masters who are like saying, I would like to, but well, now all the organization is sort of fighting against me. So what's the recommendation for those people who would like to grow empathetic leaders in around them? and be that, but it's like, feels like everything else is like only about the results and numbers and processes. Um, so I think, I think in some ways you have to pick a hill to make a stand on because what happens a lot of times is we never have time for the soft, squishy stuff in the moment because there's always the thing that needs to get finished, the thing that has to be shipped whatever like that. We, so we never have time to do things um, well the first time, but we always have time for rework. So at some point in time, there's a place where 
um, I encourage the Scrum Master to design a retrospective around something related to empathy and start the conversation. Because what happens is when people, A, feel psychologically safe, and B, are given a place to express how they feel about things, what you find is the issue that has been bugging um, the, the, one of the developers for the last two weeks, they finally get a way to express it. And, and you realize that if that had just been allowed to continue for the next six weeks, it would have been a much bigger issue to, um, to address. So there is a return on investment for having um, places for people to express things like that, but you got to give you know, design it in a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, do you what do you see as the biggest struggle in in organizations nowadays? I only get to pick one. Right. No, you can go this, <laughs> no, and this, and this, and this, and that. Right? I feel free. Um, I think, I think right now we are seeing. Um, uh, because of the pandemic and because of so many people working from home and working remotely, uh, that the people connection has been strained. And to be quite honest, in many companies, it wasn't that good to begin with. And so leaders, especially middle managers, are um, still adjusting to uh, what is needed to lead in a VUCA environment with volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity with remote workers, where I can't just regard folks as a pair of hands that I direct over their shoulder. And I think there's a lot of um, dysfunctionality and unhappiness and productivity issues that trace back to the gap between what we need leaders to be able to do and what the vast majority of the organization is doing. And a lot of that has to do with just how ingrained our ways of thinking is with how business is conducted and how, how, how the business is put together. I mean, if you look at it, it truly is 19th century business um, practices that we're trying to layer agile ways of working on top of. And no, it's no surprise that it doesn't work that good sometimes. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Smita, you have a question, right? Yeah, I do. Could I? Thank sure. you for the opportunity. Laura, um, I have worked with you. I do not know if you remember me. I, we have worked together in Azela Lens and I have taken your classes in Stanford. Oh, with yes. It's good to see you. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. I have this important question, which is very important to me at this moment. It is coming from my heart. Um, the first comment, empathy is a muscle. It is a skill that we need to exercise and develop. That said, how do I make myself more empathetic for towards somebody who I feel is trying to attack me and um, in so many ways, not physically, in a very, very subtle way. I feel this person has been setting and plotting things against me for last one year at work in so many points at times. I have tried different strategies, but how can I use empathy and get out of this situation in a good way? Oh, this is, this is interesting because there's, it, it makes me wonder, um, if it sounds like the, the interaction could almost be straying into microaggressions or um, uh, do you, do you know what I mean? Be. Yeah. Yeah. It, have you have you sat down and, and had a conversation with this person to acknowledge the you know, what it is that can be observed in terms of um, the places where there's a strain or you know what what are the types of behaviors that um, are causing friction 
because um, it's important to have the conversation, but for you not to make any assumptions about um, what it is, uh, the meaning of anything. So you can say, hey, John, I noticed that um, in the meeting that we just had, uh, it was hard for me to, to be able to express an idea because I got interrupted a couple of times. So that's something that's ob observable. But then for you, you, you can't say, um, and that means you're, you don't value me or that means whatever, because it, it, it could mean lots and lots of things. But you could say, hey, I'm, I'm observing this thing. This is the impact. Um, and I'm curious what's your perspective on it. And then just see what they have to say. Thank you, Laura. I have, um, yeah, I think it is becoming too deep and personal. I don't want to go that, you know, it, for, the, for the benefit of other audiences. I have tried uh, those things and I find it is very hard again and again. I have even connected with him saying that this is not we what this is not what we discussed in the meeting but you came out of the meeting and this is what you communicated to others etc cetera, etc cetera. i oftentimes not three or four times more than five times i felt that he contradicts himself outside the meeting and i've said this time and again you know i don't feel that i can trust you because what we discuss is not what we communicate, that we discussed, as we discussed. This uh, is... I don't know, how can I build empathy? I also feel that I feel, you know, we are colleagues, but sometimes he does command and control and I'm not a newbie. I know how things work and I know how we need to do work as a team and I'm the one who suggested when I work at my best, it is like music, but I am not able to make the best music because of this noisy background, which pulls me down and makes me lose my focus. So let me ask you this, is this, is this, are, are these behaviors that are specific to the interactions with you or are they um, broader than that? Oh, just with me, yeah. So in that case, I, I do think that it's it's probably something that um, you you need to have a one on one conversation with him. And you and mm -hmm. I can talk offline here, Sunita, about this because I have questions about you know um, are are you the only woman? You know, it, it, what are you, what does your gut say in terms of mm -hmm. why this is happening? Um, mm -hmm. and it's, it, you can't make assumptions, but sometimes those sorts of things will, will help you work through it. Um, yeah, I didn't mean to lead this to so deep. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. But it happens, right? Yeah. All right. So, well, yeah. I, I think the other thing is that you can lead with empathy and, you know, Chris Avery and the responsibility process, you're responsible for how you show up at work and how you, you do what you do. And you can, you can reach your hand out. Now, how other people react to that is, is, will vary. And you'll get the whole range of, um, of, of reactions. So mm -hmm. I think focus. that- Focus. Yeah. So, focus so, on the positive. So focus on the positive. No, also know that um, that that there's probably a history here that predates you, and it's it's hard sometimes to know um, where someone is coming from, and it's a long process for some people. So it's not, and I think that's one of the um, potential. Uh, dangers or risks in a presentation like what I just made is I could come in here and go, la -di -da -di -da -di -da. here's empathy, here's what it is, here's why it's important, here's some ideas to use it, you know, good luck. Um, and I think that uh, how it works in the real world, there's a whole range. Roland says in the chat here, um, 
uh, it's empathy for, for yourself is off, is more important than empathy for the opponent. So yeah, so um, I think that's important. And Maria is telling you, I'm facing something similar now, you're not alone. And I think that's an important thing to know as well. Because there's a reason why people talk about um, having a meditation practice, you're meant to practice it. I think empathy is the same sort of a thing. So practice it with yourself, practice it with this person, find ways to look for opportunities to have um, you know, an authentic one-on-one -on -one conversation with them, but also know that they're fighting their own dragons and um, it's hard to tell sometimes um, what's, what's going on that's triggering this. Mm -hmm. Being oh. part of a conflict is tough, right? But let's take a one step back and think if you see there is a conflict, you're not involved anyhow, but you see it. How can you help that to heal that conflict uh, as an empathetic leader, of course? Mm. Um, oh, I mean, I, I, Laura's being bad. She's looking at the chat. Um, somebody just. Um, uh, uh, recommended nonviolent communication, um, which I think is something to consider if for what Sita was talking about. And, and also mm -hmm. for the, the question that you had, Zuzi, um, is if you're, if you're observing some conflict, particularly if you're in a role as, uh, as something like a scrum master, where part of your job is to um, help, help catalyze teamwork to remove impediments to um, address um, a conflict. I think one of the questions would be, you know, is it, um, is this a systemic issue? What is driving it? Because a lot of times um, there's mm -hmm. a quote that says that he, it is, it, it's, when something's not working, the first question we should ask is, what is it about this system that's causing causing a propensity for this this conflict rather than it being just a person you know that you know Joe, joe's a jerk or jill's just being difficult today or whatever that is um so i think that i would start with that question it's one and a half and enough one and a half minutes uh, i don't think that was for us sorry oh okay that was um, random Zoom noise. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's where I would start, Zuzi. Uh, I'm a big believer in uh, crafting, uh, especially for teams, um, uh, retrospectives that help to surface those types of conflicts and acknowledging them and talking about them. Because if you just um, try to skirt the issue, it, it only gets bigger. If it helps, I have a, an experience with that one person. You can try to find someone within the meeting that can be your voice as well to be heard. Because if you feel that this person is always blocking you and always also bringing you down, um, they I have a coworker that they have noticed that if there's more than one person who noticed these the situation and the behavior, you can ask their help. Can you help me to speak up this point that I'm going to bring up to this meeting? This way, this person, if they become, uh, you know, the, the the usual deed that they do for you, uh, there's more people to speak up for you. You need uh, to also let them know that you are you have people around you that can help you bring your agenda forward too, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you want, you're trying to make the, pro, the, the trying to help the process. You're not trying to, you know, focus on your personal, uh, you know, or whatever agenda mm -hmm. it's for the team. Mm -hmm. So you have to help yourself to uh, reach out to the team to help you to, to increase that voice within the, uh, the group. Because there's a lot of people that's willing to help, and if there's people who can see this and doesn't help you, you know, there's obviously that's not that's not the people who's probably gonna speak up for you. But there are now is a time that people are willing to speak up and be your ally. Yeah, I, I was I was just thinking that uh, uh, Jasmine, you're kind of talking about um, uh, developing allyships in anticipation of. Of, of this ongoing issue 
And I think that's a, a wonderful idea. And I think that that's mm -hmm. something to, for a great reminder for everyone to, um, to look for places where they can um, speak up in um, support of someone, anyone in a, in a conflict like this. All right. So I have a last question for you. And that's, uh, if there is a one thing you want us to remember, what is that? Um, that empathy means feeling with someone and it's a skill that can be developed over time and to, uh, and to reach out and I'm cheating, right? Because I'm just adding um, things to my one thing and to give it a try and see how, how you can create more empathy in your interactions with folks in business. <laughs>